they'll definitely want to listen. I'm louder over here. <laughs> nice if you had pushed that back when we were here. I do, most of the time. <laughs> oh, we have stinkers tonight. All right. All right, Hebrews chapter 11. And I wasn't necessarily thinking of, of how far we would go. Um, because I don't know how fast we're going to actually go through. Because there's a lot to be said. Um, so I think maybe tonight... Uh, we'll just deal with Abel, because I think there's enough with Abel to, to talk about and kind of figure out um, just, just about him and, and what's being said about him. And so we'll just, we'll just take it at that point. We'll go to verse, um, uh, verse 4. We'll just do the first four verses. And it'll get, it will get bigger, because some of them, like Abraham, there's so much on Abraham. We're not going to go back in Genesis and, and just cover everything about Abraham, but, but people like Enoch, people like Abel, there, there's just a small portion of scripture in the Old Testament about them, so we probably will go back to, to that and take a look at it. So, does somebody want to read the first four verses of Hebrews 11? That's not here. That's interesting. You don't need my glasses. Yeah, my glasses. I've, got, I've written some. I just got them in the mail. Stop. Sarah hates them. Mary Sue loves them, so that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Sarah said, oh my goodness, they're red. I said, yeah, yeah. I carry them all right. That's, that's yeah. what I'm after. All right. Distinction. <laughs> now, faith, the, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. All right. Let's pray, because I really want to, again, being so familiar with the text, I don't want to lean on my own understanding. I want the, the Holy Spirit to teach us and teach me and, and show us stuff, show me stuff too that um, maybe I've never been taught before so to draw something out of this. So let's pray. Father, what a blessing it is to come together, Lord, on this night. And, and Father, thank you that we can do that without any fear of persecution. Lord, thank you that we, we live in a country where we can study the Word of God and without fear. And Lord, we do pray for our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world Lord, that can't do that, but yet are still willing to do it. So thank you for that, and thank you for everyone that's gathered. And please, Holy Spirit, teach us. Teach me from Hebrews 11. Strengthen our faith. Encourage us. and Use it however you wish. And so we yield this time to you, and pray that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and truly be our teacher tonight. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the things I had talked about prior to when we finished chapter 10 is to remember when this letter was received, when it was written, and then when it was received, there were no chapter divisions. So it's not like when they came to Hebrews 11 for us, it's, and for me teaching it, it's kind of like, all right, here's a gasp, because Hebrews 11 is one of my favorite chapters of, of the entire Bible, and it is for a lot of people, because it's really encouraging. And so we kind of pause but they wouldn't have paused. Now, I don't know how the reading was when, when they had this read, if it was one sitting or if, however they did it. But there would have been no pause, you would think. It would just have been continuous. So if we look at it continuously, remember what we talked about last week, how it was an encouragement because there were warnings prior to that. And it's really an encouragement to continue in the faith. Because the last thing they said in chapter 10 was, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and preserve their souls. So if you, if you take that and then immediately jump in, now faith, and then they give the best definition for faith that, that you're ever going to find. It's a biblical definition of faith. Um, if you look faith up, and I didn't look it up in the dictionary, but it's not going to be this, I'm sure. But this is what faith is, and this is what faith means, and this is why I always ask the Lord for more faith, because Here's the breakdown of it. 
Well, you know, it's funny. Last night with our teens, we talked about faith. And I was asking them kind of what, I can't remember how we got onto it, but I basically asked them what it means. And they said, you know, believe and trust. And I said, okay. I said, um, can you believe something without trusting? And they were like, I don't know. I said, here's an example. I believe in my kids. I believe in them. But do I trust them? Not 100%. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a breakdown there, you know. I mean, you know I, do I believe that, that they can accomplish great things? Yes. Do I trust them with precious things? Probably not. And, but when it comes to faith in Christ, there has to be a belief and there has to be a trust. It's, it's different. If we say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I don't trust in him. Satan believes in Jesus, but he doesn't trust him. And you can't trust in him without believing in him. And what we did was we were talking about um, verse 6, which we won't get to tonight. But here's the, the beautiful definition of it. When you take faith, and if you were to dissect it, this is what we get. Faith is the assurance. I think we understand what that means. It means to be sure of something. We're, we are confident in this. But what are we confident of? Of things hoped for. And it's not the kind of hope that the world hopes. Um, you know, we hope things, but we hope in sort of in a cloud of doubt. I hope this is going to happen, but when we say that, we're really not sure. In fact, we're kind of leaning toward it probably won't happen, but I hope it'll happen. But that's not the kind of hope that's referred to here. When we hope in God, it's a firm hope. It's, it's a confident hope that we can trust in him because he's made promises. And if God has made promises and he ceases to keep those promises, then he's not God. So we're either all in or we're all out in the sense of either he's God and he makes promises and we believe him all in or we don't, you know, he can't keep his promises, then he's not God. So let's just back away from it because that's pointless. So the point of it is now to hope in God is to hope with confidence, to know that it's going to come to pass at some point, we're assured of it. But then, the second part of the definition is it's the conviction of things not seen. We live in a, we live in a society. We live in a, well, it's, it's human nature. Seeing is believing. You've heard that, right? Well, this turns out completely upside down. It says um, not seeing is kind of believing, or, or to believe is not to see. And they get into this, and, and this is setting up why, um, why it starts off with this, because we're coming to these people. And here's, here's a, a thing I thought about today. It's almost like the writer of Hebrews is asking a hypothetical question. And whether or not the reader would ask it, he's answering it before it's asked, because they just talked about, okay, but we're not those who, who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and preserve their souls. So the first question would be, well, what is faith? Well, he answers that. And then you would almost think, because remember, we, as we go through the book of Hebrews, the whole, the main point of it is, is the supremacy of Christ. And we've gone through the supremacy of Christ over Abraham, over angels, over all these things. So it would lead you to think, well, okay, wait a minute then. If it's faith in Christ, then how are the Old Testament saints that we've heard all about, how are they saved? And that's a question that a lot of people give regardless. And if anybody ever comes to you with that question, well, how were they saved? Take them to Hebrews 11 and just let them read it because this is how they were saved. Um, so it, it's a asking that question whether or not it was asked by the readers, but the Holy Spirit knows and he knows the hearts of people when, when they would be receiving this letter. So I think it's a great thing because remember they didn't, and again, we don't know the writer of Hebrews. I had a thought, I had an interesting thought of somebody that maybe wrote this. Um, I thought maybe Peter wrote it. And here's why I thought that. Because Peter is was the apostle to the Jews, where the apostle Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. So he ne wouldn't necessarily be writing to the uh, Jewish believers, but Peter would. And then I also thought how interesting it is, because Paul was, was a, a rabbi, so he was formally trained on stuff, where the writer here sometimes... I don't want to say mix this stuff up. It includes stuff in the most holy place that wasn't there. So maybe they weren't as formally trained. But anyway, take that. <laughs> we'll find that out when we get to heaven. Or we'll ask God, who wrote Hebrews? And he'll say, it's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> so then when you go ask Peter, I'll lean back and I'll say, is he 
you? <laughs> yeah, so we'll find out. But anyway, I've never heard anybody think it was Peter. So maybe it was Peter, but regardless. So it's the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And think of that word conviction. Um, think of it in a courtroom when, when somebody is on trial and they're convicted of a crime. When somebody's on trial, they are not yet convicted. What makes a person convicted of a trial or of a crime? There has to be evidence. And the evidence has to be brought and it has to be proven. And so basically what this is saying is we are convinced. We, we have proof through faith. And don't forget that because already it's the assurance of things hoped for. So we know God made promises and they're going to come to pass. So there's, there's part of it. But it's also convincing us of things that we haven't seen. But on the other side of that is we don't have to see that. People, I think, sometimes who don't understand Christianity and don't understand faith and want to be critical of it, they kind of look at faith as a cop-out. Well, you know, you don't have to see it. Well, you know, that's just, that's easy. Well, faith isn't easy. I think we would all say that. There are times where faith is difficult because, again, we're, we're struggling with ourselves. We're struggling with um, the world. We're struggling with, with supernatural things that don't want us to have faith. So faith isn't just something that just is, you got to work for it. And, and it's a gift from God at the same time. So it's kind of like, um, uh, oh, what am I thinking? I'm missing the word. Uh, what is the word where we become, I'm having a brain moment, where we become more like Christ? What is that word? What am I missing? Matt always talks about it. Oh, when we go through the process of being more Christ-like, now I've given you guys a brain hiccup. Um, why am I not thinking of that word? It's not, it's not justification. It's not justification. Yes, it is sanctification. Don't be shy. Yes, that's it. Yes, thank, man, my brain just wasn't going there. Um, sanctification is one of those mysteries in that it's, we're dependent upon the Lord, but at the same time, we need to be striving toward it. Faith is kind of the same thing. We're dependent upon the Lord for faith, but at the same time, we need to be exercising that and striving toward more faith. So there is somewhat of a mystery of it. But again, this is the best definition of faith that you're ever going to have. To dissect faith and to split it up, it's we're, we're assured. We know it's going to happen. Things that, that, we, that God has promised, and that's a big part in this whole Hebrews chapter 11 is the promises of God. And, and we're convinced of it. it would, beyond any shadow of a doubt, we're convinced of it. And yet we haven't seen it. We haven't been there. But as we get into this, this is going to kind of be what introduces us to these people that had this kind of faith. A lot of times when we think of it, we're thinking back to Jesus. You know, we, we, we didn't see Jesus on the cross. But we know he did all this stuff. But they're, think, they're on the other side of that. And they're thinking forward and they didn't have a name. They didn't have an act. They didn't have anything. They just had a promise and, and the prophets and things like that. But if you think of Abraham, what promise did they have? Not nearly as, as definable promises as we have, but yet they believed God. And then, and that's where we came to it. It's belief, but it's not just, it's belief with trust. And they, that is credited to them as righteousness. And the same thing is true with us. We believe in Christ. We believe and trust him. And we get his righteousness. We, we believe that he died on the cross for our sins. We trust in that. We believe he's been raised from the dead. We are trusting in that he's alive and able to save. And, and when we do that, that's saving faith. And, and he bestows upon us and imputes us with his righteousness. So, now, we, we have a definition of faith, so now the question will be, well, what about the Old Testament saints? And here it's answered. For by it, the people alone received their commendation. They received that commendation from whom? Who do you think gave them that commendation? God. Yeah. That's really the only commendation that matters, is that God is pleased with us, is that he sees, he he recognizes our faith. Our faith is saving faith. Um, we receive his righteousness, these kind of things. It really only matters how, how God views our faith. Because, um, you know, there's been times, I'm sure, all of us where people had thought, wow, what great faith. And maybe we didn't have great faith. 
Or maybe when people thought, well, we didn't have great faith in a certain situation, but we were exhibiting more faith that just wasn't evident. But God sees all that stuff. But no matter how it looks to other people, God knows whether we're having faith in a certain moment. And, and faith isn't the absence of fear. I think that's a big um, misconception. Faith is overcoming fear. Because we're afraid at times. There's fear can, can flood in. But if we allow that fear to take hold and bear fruit, then that's not faith. And, and sin is, is basically anything that's not done in faith. So if, if we allow fear to take hold, then we're sinning. But if we have the fear and then we allow the faith to overcome that, then that's, that's using our faith. That's exhibiting our faith. That's pleasing to God. That's, that's how we grow in our faith as well. So... Now we know that the people of old, that's how they received their commendation from God. And by faith, and this is, this is for all of us, by faith we understand that the universe was... I'm laughing because I, I always ask a question. <laughs> was anybody there when the universe was made? <laughs> Don't you raise your hand or anything. <laughs> we weren't there. Nobody was there. And that's what's utterly amazing about science today. The Bible is not at war with science. Science is at war with the Bible. Because if we see science in its proper um, position, we can look through the Bible and see, yeah, science, it's there. But what they want to do is look through science as the scope and then reinterpret Scripture, and that's, that's all wrong. Um, because here's the answer. I mean, so many people have dedicated their lives and probably billions upon billions of dollars to try to find the origins of the universe. I mean, they spend so, so much time and money to do that. But here's what it says. By faith, and that's how all this stuff begins, because now you plug in that definition. By the assurance of things hoped for, promises, and the conviction of things not seen, we understand. So it gives us, we're smarter than, than scientists who don't believe in God. And I'm not saying you wear that as a badge and brag about it, but... So many people are searching out the origins of the universe, and it gives us the answer right here. But you have to believe it by faith because we weren't there. But here's the reality. Those people who believe in, like, the Big Bang Theory or whatever, that's by faith, too. Yeah. They can't prove that. Science falls on two different things. It's, it's something that, that has to be um, basically seen or, or witnessed, and you have to be able to repeat it. But you can't repeat any of that. So it's not truly science. It's, it's a theory, and it's based on faith. It's not biblical faith, but it's faith because they don't know. But here, we're getting a definition, or we're getting the origin of the universe by God who can't lie. I think ours is a little more reliable. But by faith, it says we understand. It's not that we think or we hope in, in the way the world hopes. No, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. He spoke it into existence. And it says, so that what, it was, what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Um, that's called ex nihilo, which is from nothing. God created everything from nothing. He didn't go to some other universe that, you know, in some place else and like grab particles and bring them in and then begin with that. That's not how the universe was created. And you don't need to turn there, but Genesis 1-1 really says it all. I don't even know why I'm turning there. I know what it says. In the beginning, God. <laughs> By the time I get through all this prep, <coughs> that's really all we need, isn't it? <clears throat> in the beginning, God. That's it. Because if you're there in the beginning, what does that tell you? You were there before the beginning began. <laughs> so, before the beginning began, God. And, and it's funny because kids, and, and my kids, if we've had discussions about that. Well, where did God come from? I think it's a valid question. Because a lot of times there's, there's involved in that, to me, is, is, a, is a deeper truth than they probably realize. Because they're recognizing that for something to exist, it has to be created. That's, and that's a good thing. You look at the universe. Yes, that has to be created. And you know it wasn't created by a man. But... I say you, you cannot look upon God on the same plane as you look upon 
humans or any other creation because he's the creator. It's completely different. And sometimes our minds are thinking, well, everything has to be created, so, um, you know, then he had to be created. That's, that's true unless you're the creator. Because if you're the creator, it stops with you. Because he's God, and that's the thing. If, if, if it were a man, then yeah, you would have to keep going back and going back and going back and going back and find out, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and, and that's the way it is. But God's not a man. God, God is, is supernatural. Time, see, we think in time. God's not in time. So he always has been, he always will be, he always is. It's, I know it's hard, to, and it's hard for my kids. Like, wow, I just don't understand. Okay, you don't have to understand in that sense. But by faith, we do understand. Faith gives us the understanding to, to trust and to believe and to have that conviction of, yeah, I don't need to see it, but I know it's true. And so here we have it. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. I mean, imagine that. And you know what? In that sense, there was a big bang. <laughs> it was a big bang because God spoke. <laughs> you know, stuff was created. Now, that's not what they're thinking about when they think of a big bang. And it really makes no sense because, and it's been a while since I've studied the Big Bang Theory, but basically it's, you know, pressurized, I don't know if it's pressurized at or what it is, and then that explodes, but that doesn't answer the question of origin. Because where did the atom come from? You, you, can't, you can't just have something from nothing unless it's created, and so we get the answer here is that God created everything that we see, everything that we experience and touch and feel and all this, and he created it from nothing. And you can really expand on this a little bit if you want to just sit in prayerful meditation about it and just think things that we enjoy, you know, the, the beauty of a tree, but then the beauty of color, all of this stuff, how brilliant and, and just how smart's not enough to say it, but um, his imagination, you know, the, the smell of things, you know, things don't have to smell <clears throat> the way that they do. Things don't have to be the color that they are, but God did all of that, and he did it by the power of his word. It's just, it's amazing, and it's, it, I really, I, I encourage you to just spend some time and just, just think and let your mind go as far as you want to go in creation, and as, and as big or as small, even the smallest things, even he created, and it's just, it's, it's amazing. So we understand that this happened by God from nothing, ex nihilo. By the power of his word. So now we come into um, now we come into people. By faith, Abel. Are y'all familiar with Abel? Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel, and Cain killed Abel. Now we're going to get into a little bit why he killed Abel. And I'll tell you this: um, when I when I first became a Christian, and I don't remember when I was taught it, I was taught. And we can turn there to Genesis chapter 4. Because again, Abel's not, this isn't a, a, bit, a long story. But I'll tell you what I was originally taught about Cain and Abel. And maybe you were taught, um, maybe you were taught that too. Is that, well, we'll read it again. Then I'll give you what I originally was taught. And then I'll give you what I've been taught since by several. And this is what I, what I hold to more. Um, than what I used to, but I'll go ahead and read this, Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And one of the things that, that's interesting to me is names, and I always just, sometimes there's significance in names, sometimes there's not. Um, but Weakness or breadth of, you know, kind of brevity is sort of the name for Abel. He didn't last long. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting how names, and it's a Hebrew word, it's actually Habel is, is the actual Hebrew pronunciation of it, but we, we the Greek form of it is Abel. Um, so we understand now they had two sons, and, and um, Abel is a keeper of sheep, and Cain is a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord, and that's Yahweh, so don't forget who we're, we're talking about here, um, 
brought to Yahweh an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the first flock, or firstborn of his flock, and, the, and their fat portions. And the Lord <clears throat> had regard for Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, <clears throat> and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And <clears throat> why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. You must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and, when they, and we don't know what that conversation was. <clears throat> but when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So there's the first murder. And it didn't take long after sin, after Adam and Eve fell. I've got this little thing in my throat that's giving me, I'm going to have to cough it out. <coughs> Because it's going to keep tickling my throat. <clears throat> it didn't take long after the fall, after sin entered and all creation was affected, it didn't take long for a murder to happen. And it was a brother against brother. So, here's the question. Why did God look with favor upon Abel's and not with Cain's? Now, originally what I was taught with this is it was about attitude. It was about Cain had a bad attitude about it, and Abel had a good attitude about bringing these offerings. And I think where people get that from is because his face fell. So they're like, oh, he's angry, he's upset. He, he just doesn't have the proper attitude. But, we can turn back to, to Hebrews now. Um, when you look at, at what Hebrews says about it, it's a little bit different. Because again, the greatest commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice. Doesn't say anything about his attitude. Doesn't say anything about um, the what is what is the focus. It's what is being sacrificed. So, what is a more um, acceptable sacrifice? Now, here's the reality of it. Um, Cain was a farmer, so obviously you would think, okay, he's given the first fruits. He's bringing that. And there were offerings in the Old Testament of where they, they offered produce and things like that. But what takes away sin? It's not a fruit offering. It's a blood offering. So the idea of being a more... And, and here's the thing. And let's, let's kind of walk this back to move forward. Adam and Eve sinned, and they tried to, to create cover up their sin and their nakedness with fig leaves. They tried to, basically that was their attempt to deal with sin themselves. And what did God do in response to that? He made them clothes. Now, and we've talked about this, skinning an animal, there's blood, there's death. You don't skin a live animal. So there was an animal, animals that were killed, blood that was shed so that they could be covered. But the bigger picture of that is God, I believe, was teaching Adam and me, but teaching Adam that it's only blood that covers your sin. You can't do fig leaf because now you recognize that you're naked. That's not going to fix your sin problem. Because remember, there was separation from God because they hid from God in the garden. So it would make sense that Adam would pass this down to his kids. Because now he recognizes, because he's, he's heard of basically the curse that's now upon humanity. So he knows they're all going to be born with a sin nature. So he's got to pass that down to them. Because obviously, Abel is bringing a more acceptable sacrifice. Acceptable by who? By God. God is receiving this. And we know that God would receive sacrifices of first fruits. He did that all the time. And, and you look through the book of Leviticus. But he would not receive that in relation to sin. And it's also, it also kind of plays out as if Cain is, is sort of saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with sin my own way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with it myself, and here's what I'm bringing to you. And God says, that's not, that's not good enough. It's not acceptable. I do not accept your offering. And then I kind of have a, a, I don't know what you would call it, maybe a theory. Why did he kill him? What, how did that enter into his mind? I almost think that maybe he's like, all right, you want a blood offering? Here's your blood. I'll give you blood. Almost like a, a, a snub, because they were having communication with God, obviously. And he probably knew he should have been giving a blood offering, and he didn't do it. So what does he do? I'll give my brother. 
I'll sacrifice his blood. You want blood? Now you got it. And, and here's the reality of it. By faith, Abel did this. By faith, he was offering a blood sacrifice, and it's more acceptable than Cain. And it's not just because Cain didn't have faith. He had faith. He believed in God. He, he, was, he was having communication with God. So he knew that he existed. He knew all these things. And then the curse upon Cain, when he has this communication with God, he's like, I can't bear this. He's still having communication with God, but he's not believing the promise that we know later in Scripture is that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. He doesn't believe that, so he doesn't offer blood up to God for his own sins. And how wicked, because God, God warns him, sin is at your door. How do you master sin? Through forgiveness. You don't master it by trying to overcome it with your own strength and power. It doesn't work like that. But when we're forgiven, the power of sin is loose. It, it doesn't, we're not chained to it anymore. Maybe that's what God was trying to communicate to him. If you want to master this, then, then you should offer, as your brother Abel did, you should offer a, a right sacrifice that will deal with your sin. But he didn't do that. And maybe he, maybe, I don't know, maybe he thought Abel's the, the sacrifice. But I don't think he was doing it as a sacrifice because he gets real snotty with, with God. And like, where's your brother? Is he my, am I his keeper? So I don't think he was doing that. But he may have, you know, hey, you want blood? Here's blood. But again, that's just my own take on it. But here's the, the thing about Abel's offering. It was a more acceptable sacrifice and through which he was commended as righteous. So faith right there, we recognize that he had, a, he, there were promises that were passed down to him that he believed, and there were things that he wasn't going to necessarily see, but he's looking forward to something. He's believing that God will take away his sins. And that's what those, those sacrifices that they made in the Old Testament of the shedding of blood you know, and we've talked about it already in the book of Hebrews. It was more of a covering, but it's, it's a shadow that leads to the substance of Christ that will take away sins forever. And Abel believed that. Now, how do you believe that? I, I don't know. I mean, faith, we can read in Ephesians, the gift of God. I don't know how, but, but he just believed. And that's all that it boils down to. He believed God. And he sacrificed rightly, and it was commended to him as righteous. And it's not works. Faith is not works. Faith is just believing. I mean, we just trust what God is going to do and the promise that he made. And then it says, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And again, think of it in the context of blood. He accepted that blood on his behalf. So if he sacrificed blood from an animal, but understanding and looking forward to a more supreme sacrifice, what is he really doing? Trusting Christ. Yeah, he's trusting in Jesus. You know, he didn't have a name or anything along those lines, but he's trusting in that, that supreme sacrifice. And we've already gone through the book of Hebrews and know that Jesus is the supreme sacrifice. He's the supreme high priest who offered the supreme sacrifice, which is himself. So Abel is, is believing in that supreme sacrifice. Um, so and it says, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And I thought about this this morning as I was just kind of going over this and reading through um, a commentary. And I thought, man, that'd be a really good thing to have on a headstone. Because in, in the writer, Albert Moeller, talks about that. What a testimony of a life. Though you die, you still speak. Because your life is a testimony. It's a testimony of the power of God through salvation in Jesus Christ. You know, that speaks generations. And that's how Abel, though he, and, and through his faith, so his believing, his assurance, his conviction of things that he didn't see. I mean, he didn't see much. You know, when you think about the prophets and all of these things, um, you know, he, was, he didn't see the Garden of Eden because they were already expelled from that. So he saw what Sim was doing, but, you know, there weren't a lot of people around. So when you think of it, he didn't see a whole lot. He didn't live a very long life. We don't know exactly how long he lived. I don't think I have it. If I have it, I don't know where I got it, but let me see. I don't think I have anything in here that says how old he was. And if anybody says they know how old he was, it's pure speculation. I mean, we don't know how old he actually was. But in the grand scheme of it, he didn't see a lot. Um, but he saw enough 
in the sense of he believed God, he trusted in God, and yet, though he died, though he lived a very short life, he's still speaking today because he just, he just spoke to us. He just testified to Christ, to us. So this still holds true. How many years, thousands and thousands of years, Abel is still speaking today that all we have to do is trust God. Trust in a blood sacrifice, trust in the Supreme One, and that's Christ alone. Um, so we're going to stop there. Wow. You were right, Roy. It's going to be short. <laughs> Roy said it's either loud or short. It's going to be short today. Because I don't want to get into Enoch because I want to um, spend a little more time in him because he's, he's even more of a mystery because um, we don't know much about Abel. We know less about Enoch. And and there are, there are books that are written about Enoch um, that are called um, the Book of Enoch, but most scholars believe that was not written by this Enoch. It couldn't have been. So, and it's not part of the Bible. I have it. I've read it. It's interesting. Um, it talks a lot about um, demons and, and things of that nature and spiritual warfare, but you have to take it with a grain of salt because the people who felt led by the Holy Spirit to include certain books in the Bible and not others... That was one they didn't include because they couldn't, authorship wasn't there. I mean, it just, there was a lot of things wrong with it. So anyway, we don't know a lot about Enoch, but again, he lived an incredible life. And so by faith, that's how he lived his life. So we'll get into that next week. And we, I don't know how far we'll get. We'll probably get to Abraham next week. So we'll go through Enoch and then we'll talk about Noah and, um, and those things. And then we'll get to Abraham. Abraham has a bigger chunk than most do. And, um, but the cool thing about it, and Matt and I were talking about this last night, because as we were going through this with teens, he's back there reading Hebrews 11, he said, you know, it amazes me of some of the people that were included in this. Because there's some people that we would look at as kind of scoundrels that are included in it. Samson's one. I mean, that guy, he lived a really messed up life. Now in the end, though, he obviously came to faith. So he's in it. And one that I was thinking about today that's really intriguing is the Israelites who passed through the Red Sea. They're included in the, the Hall of Fame of Faith. But you think about what they did once they got on the other side of it. They worshipped a golden calf. They didn't believe the spies or they didn't believe God. And then they died in the desert. But yet, they're still included here. So I think there's hope for us. <laughs> you know, faith is not perfect. You don't have to be perfect to have faith, it's, it's, I don't know, God included some really, really interesting people. And Enoch's another one, because when you read through the Bible in the, in the Genesis account of Enoch, you get through it really fast. And if we didn't have anything in Hebrews, we probably wouldn't mention him again. I can't remember if he's mentioned in Jude. I'll have to go back and look at that reference. But um, it's just, you just pass over it so quickly because it's kind of going through the genealogy and you know everybody gets bored of genealogies and stuff like that. But um, but he's included in this. So that says something about his life and about his faith and, and what he was looking toward. So does anybody have anything they want to add or questions? Anything wrong? Can't be studied. All right. We'll go ahead and shut it down.